All right, hi everybody. Welcome back to the final session of our five-part journey through Jesus of Nazareth. Um, so we left off last week with those the two milestones along on Jesus' way. Um, I will make the caveat that I am going to every five minutes check this recording again because ain't no room for error. <laughs> so, um, so today we're going to cover the last chapter, chapter 10, Jesus declares his identity. Um, and we're going to get through as much of the outline as we can. Uh, again, I just, as I say every time, please read the book. Just take time. Take a sentence by sentence. There are, there are parts of it that are heavy, that they, they, they don't flow, like they're not just entertaining. Uh, and you have to work real hard, but it's so worth it. So please uh, keep that in mind. Get a copy of the book. Read it. It's amazing. Um, so we're going to start. Jesus declares his identity. Um, already during Jesus' lifetime, uh, people tried to interpret his mysterious figure by applying to him categories that were familiar to him, to them. Um, and we had talked about this a little bit in the past, but that uh, he's seen as, again, John the Baptist or Elijah um, or Jeremiah or as the prophet. Um, and so, again, like Pope Benedict mentioned last time, they're, they're trying to, they're dealing with the past, the possible, um, and, and what they've seen done before. And so they try to put him into those categories, but we find time and again that you can't fit him in a category because he's just all categories. And so what you see happening, and this is what we sprang off of uh, back at Peter's confession, is that they begin to assign terms that, that are maybe the loftiest or grandest that they can, they can grasp onto, that their mind can even get near. Uh, so Peter uses uh, Messiah, son of the living God. And so what Pope Benedict points out is that these three fundamental titles start to emerge. We have Christ, uh, which means Messiah. We have Kyrios, which means Lord. And then we have Son of God. And those are the three things that begin to emerge about him as he is in the public eye, as he is revealing himself, as he is uh, working miracles and, and living out uh, his divinity in the flesh. Um, so this first title, the, the one of Christ slash Messiah, uh, taken by itself, it meant very little outside of like the Messianic, or sorry, the Semitic culture. Um, it didn't have much of a meaning elsewhere. And in Semitism, it had its own like literal meaning. It, it meant just Messiah, Christ. Um, and so what happens is it quickly ceased to function outside of anything as a title. It, it ceased to be um, anything else but Jesus Christ. It was joined with the name of Jesus. And there's, you've probably heard the joke, people say, like, well, his last name isn't Christ, like Nick Davidson, Jesus Christ. But there's a certain sense in which very quickly something to that nature does happen. Uh, much, I mean, obviously deeper and whatnot, but it, it becomes attached to him so that you wouldn't use it. Uh, Christ is Jesus. Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. They, they become... Um, part and parcel. Uh, and so he points out that what began as an interpretation uh, of who he was just ended up as his name. That that very quickly people were trying to, okay, I guess, I guess you could call him the Messiah, the Christ. But then it eventually became just that's who he is. This is him. He is the Messiah, the Christ. Um, and so he says what happens in there lies a deeper meaning, a deeper message, that he is completely one with his office. His task and his person are inseparable. That, and it's an important point that he makes and that for you to understand that Jesus, he didn't just come with a goal. It's all part, he is one with the goal. He, his reason for being, uh, for, for coming in the form of the flesh and living the life and the, living out the passion and the death and resurrection, that's all it's not just like, well, that's kind of why I came. That is him. It's wrapped up. It's his identity. It's all part and parcel. So you have this first title, this one of Messiah, of Christ. Um, and so that leaves these two, Kyrios and Son, uh, which they both point in the same direction. Lord at the time had become a paraphrase for the divine name. And again, we, you know, you, we've, you've heard about in Scripture how the name is, it's, it is the person's entity. Um, and so that's why name changes from Abram to Abraham, uh, the, the, from Jacob to Israel. Like that, those mean something because the name is symbolic of the person's entity, their existence. Their, it's existential. And so the name itself matters. So Lord, the word Lord has become, had at that time become synonymous with the divine name. Which, and I, I think we might have talked about this before, but you know, when they would write the name of God, uh, the scribes, when they were like translating scripture or transferring it or recopying it, that they had a separate pen 
for just the name of God, and that they would never write the full name of God. You'll see sometimes in English it'll be G hyphen D. That's because the name the have you know don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Like they didn't just not even just to shy away from in vain, but you just you don't you don't just use it. And so because it is the entity, it is the person of God to use His name to invoke His name. Um, so the the having the name Lord represent the divine name, then that actually ended up being to Jesus that was claiming him for communion with the Father, with God himself. By applying that to Jesus, that that stated that the belief was that he was in full, he was that entity. That you have this guy, again, you have to remember, you have a human man standing in front of you, and this human man, in whatever way we can get our minds even close to, is the creator of all things. Uh, he it identified him as the living God present among us, as Emmanuel, God with us. And so when it comes to the, the title of Messiah, Jesus didn't actually even apply that name to himself. Um, whenever messianic titles, you can even see up until a certain point, up until the cross, that anytime somebody tried to apply Messiah to him, uh, or Christ, you know, Christ Messiah to him, he, he didn't apply it to himself. Uh, whenever they were used, he would enjoin them to be silent. Like he would, that's when he would be like, now don't tell anybody about this. Because he didn't want it misunderstood because they would think the Messiah is here. He's going to overthrow him. We've talked about that temptation of overthrowing and being a ruler. And he didn't want that confusion. So just, no, 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 don't, don't, use, don't, don't use that phrase for me yet. It's not ready. It's not time. And when it became time was when they wrote King of the Jews over his head on the cross while he wore that crown. It is now permissible, Pope Benedict says, because there is no longer any chance of it being misunderstood. The cross is his throne, and as such it gives the correct interpretation of the title. And I, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but uh, regnavit a ligno deus, but God reigns from the wood of the cross. There's an ancient church, like a hymn, that the ancient church would sing, that God reigns, but he reigns from the wood of the cross, not from like a stone throne, not from metal, but from the wood of the cross. And that is what he wanted, again, that is the clarity, that he didn't just want it to be clear, that is clarity, to understand that he was here always with the cross in mind, that he always had the death and resurrection, the sacrifice of himself for us in mind. It was always burning in front of him. So what we need to do, Pope Benedict says, is then to attend somewhat more closely to the titles that Jesus does apply to himself, um, according to the evidence of the Gospels. Uh, there are two. So his preferred self-designation that he uses is Son of Man, and then there's also just Son. And so we're going to delve into those two things a little bit here. This is Because again, why, why, this, why is this the final chapter? Because this is how, not even just how we would understand. You remember way back at the beginning in the intro or the foreword, it talked about how you know, people would interpret the historical Jesus and using the historical method. Well, this is bringing it full circle to be like, well, okay, but then what, how does he reveal himself? Who does he actually say he is? And that's why we end with this. Uh, for the, so the first is Son of Man. Uh, the term Son of Man is used 14 times in the Gospel of Mark alone, and it occurs only on the lips of Jesus. So he exclusively, exclusively begins using this term for himself. In the whole of the New Testament, the term Son of Man is found only on Jesus' lips with the single exception of the vision of the open heavens that Stephen has as he's martyred. But other than that, every other time it is found on Jesus' lips. He is using that phrase. Uh, and I love it because we begin with this, that in both Hebrew and Aramaic, the first meaning of the term son of man is simply man. So uh, we, we have, I mean, because we're way later and we have, the, we already just, oh, that's Jesus. No, but like the first meaning of it, like the first level of understanding is just man. But even that, because the, the, he said that simple word blends together with the mysterious allusion to the new consciousness of mission in terms of the son of man. That like even just even just using that phrase on its like lowest level or its highest, less deep, its shallowest level, even using it then, he's already showing okay. But this is the uh, the idea of the term of the the mission of man. But then go back to uh, Genesis, when God creates mankind, Adam. That even that idea that Jesus comes as the second man to redeem what happened in Genesis, to redeem the fall to be, you know, to, to be the second Adam. And 
in his choosing of terminology, he, he's in the first seconds that you would hear it in the Jewish culture, you would have that level. Like he's, he's calling himself the man. He is calling himself mankind. And so uh, that, that term itself, son of man, wasn't in, in circulation uh, during his day as like a title of messianic hope. It wasn't something that would immediately be like, oh, and he's also claiming to be the Messiah. It would just be, he's, he's claiming to be man. Like, and so there's so, we don't have time. There's so many, probably in your own head, you're thinking like, just pause. You, you don't know this guy and he's doing all these things and he starts using this term for himself of just man. He's, I mean, son of man is what they hear, but the first layer is just, he is, he is man. He is mankind. Like that even gets you thinking like, well, what, is, what does he mean? Why is he doing that? And part of that is that question like, well, wait, what do you, what do you mean? I, I thought I understood what that term meant. And then you're using it for yourself, but you're not like any man I've ever known. And so that's, that's Pope Benedict points out. That's part of what he's doing. Hold on. Yes, we're still good. That's part of what he's doing is he, he wants, uh, you know, in using parables and whatnot, he's, he uses this to both conceal and reveal. Just because he doesn't come flat out immediately and just be saying, like, I'm God. But the phrase he uses causes people to go, well, wait, what now? What, what do you mean? Uh, what do you, uh, can you clarify? And he points out that's what Jesus does all the time with his riddles, with his parables. He's trying to lead you gradually into, so and this is big. Okay, if you're zoning out, listen. He leads you gradually to the hidden reality that can only truly be discovered through discipleship. And that's Pope Benedict again, coming back. We're not just hearing a story. We're not just seeing a, a, an amazing tale of what happened long ago. Even if it was miraculous and mystical and it was God redeeming, we, he, Pope Benedict is never letting us, and Jesus obviously is never letting us, but Pope Benedict in this book is never letting us move it from applying to ourselves. Every word in the book and every word in the gospels is to apply to you. And Pope Benedict doesn't want you to forget that. You have to remember that everything is about relationship, but you only get the, the level of relationship, the level of intimacy that Christ came for. How? Through discipleship. You have to remember. So we're doing this in Lent. Why? Not just because it's an awesome book, because it is. Not just because it's this revelatory, amazing, it brings God close. Absolutely. But we're doing it during Lent, at least when we're recording it. We're doing it now. Why? Because we are called to be disciples. This is the exact footsteps we're called to follow. You and I, we, when we hear these scenes in the scriptures where they're you know, questioning him or doing it, like this is, it isn't abstract. It is now. It is for you now so that you become a better disciple, so that you follow him more closely. So Pope Benedict takes time and he, uh, he gr groups um, these sayings about the Son of Man into these three. The first group, uh, anytime it's used, it's in discourse about the end of the world. Um, so you have him in the trial before the Sanhedrin. Uh, they're, they're, and they're questioning him and he's on trial. He, he is a criminal. He's accused. He's, he's not in good standing. And you have him then begin referencing the Son of Man. Um, and so he points out these are sayings about his future glory, about his coming to judge and to gather the righteous, the elect. So that's, it, it has this future, futuristic concept to it. But again, this is Pope Benedict points out, we must not overlook, however, that they are spoken. So pause. Think of these. Um, a, the, a reference to future glory. Picture Jesus referencing future glory, refer, referencing that he will come to judge. And that he will gather the righteous. He will gather the elect. That is grand. That is, that is, I mean, that's like, that strikes a little fear up in you. Because he's like, I'm going to come back and I will judge. Like, I, I like that in the creed. when we say, I always say, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Because it's tempting to say, he will come again in glory. No, he will come again. Every Sunday you get to remind yourself, he will come. But I love it because then Pope Benedict says, whatever picture you had in your head of Jesus in that moment... He says, you can't overlook, however, these are spoken by a man who stands before his judges. So he's talking about being the judge. He's, he's talking about being all of this, but he is being judged. He's being accused and he is being mocked while he's saying these words. The, Pope Benedict says, in these very words, glory and the passion are inextricably intertwined. It's so beautiful. You, you have these two scenes going on. You, you get rid of the lofty prophecy and you just have this guy who's accused and mocked that he's on trial for being so many things. 
But then the words, you push that aside, but then you have these words of grandeur and that they're both in the same moment, that they're wrapped up again in the same person, that they're inextricable. You, you, they're to get, they're knit. They, they're, you, it's like the spirit body composite. It's all of what he came for and all of his existence and all that he is just wrapped up in these moments. And, point, and Pope Benedict points out, he doesn't actually, Jesus doesn't mention the passion himself. But that's the actual reality in which he finds himself and in which he is speaking. He doesn't point, because again, his words are about this future glory. He doesn't point out about the coming and suffering that the, the Son of Man must do, because he's in it. That's the reality he's in, in that moment. He is currently living out the beginnings of this glory, if you will. He says, you, you encounter this, uh, this same concept about the passion and, and the, the glory and the passion all together in one, in the last judgment parable. Uh, because he puts himself in that parable. Jesus puts himself in the scene as the role of judge. He identifies himself with those who, in, in that parable, he identifies himself with uh, those who hunger and thirst, the strangers, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, with all of those who suffer in the world. And then he describes behavior toward them as behavior toward himself. And you know that parable. I mean, the, where the, many will come to them, well, when? When were you naked? When were you? And he says, well, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And when you ignored and neglected them, you ignored and neglected me. So in this parable, Jesus puts himself as son of man, he puts himself as the role of judge. But Pope Benedict says, like, because a parable, you know, is a heavenly or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But he says that this is no mere fiction about the judge of this world. That when Jesus is doing this, this isn't fiction. This isn't just a parable. In being, in, he says, in becoming incarnate, he accomplished this identification with the utmost literalism. Now pause. This again, this is in, in the parable of the last judgment, I mean, with all of them, but in this, strikingly so. We have Jesus who, who is not just making up a fiction, not just saying, well, it's kind of like I'll be a judge. He's saying that in this moment, that this is no mere fiction, this is incarnate, that he accomplished the identification with the utmost literalism. That he is the man, think about it, he is the man without property or a home who has no place to stay, no place to lay his head. He is the prisoner, he is the accused, and he dies naked on the cross. This isn't, this isn't abstract. This is actual. In this parable, he's saying that I, I am the judge, but, but when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Because I am naked, I am imprisoned, I have no place to lay my head. I am all of these things. And it says that the identification of the Son of Man who judges the world with those who suffer in every way presupposes that the judge's identity with earthly Jesus, and it reveals the inner unity of the cross and glory, of earthly existence in lowliness and future authority to judge the world. Again, they're, they're happening like at the same time in him. That these, there's, there's no separating any of this. It's all one that he is all in all. Pope Benedict says, the Son of Man is one person alone. Because, you know, we have this reference to Son of Man. It, it, it can mean man, but it, he's saying, no, 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 in the end, it is one person. That person is Jesus. And this identity shows us the way, shows us the criterion, pause, what is he going to do? What is he about to, what does Pope Benedict always keep doing? We have this amazing moment of this interconnectedness and revealing of himself and whatnot. And then he says this, that it shows us the way. Shows us the criterion according to which our lives will one day be judged. Holy cow. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that means that in that moment, like what he just says in that parable, is he's not just talking about him being the judge and you being the one who is judged. He's saying, no, 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 this is the standard you'll be judged by. How you treated me. What path did you walk? Because through every parable he gave us, through every word that he said to us, he gave us the way. He is the way. And it gives us a, crit a criterion. So we have this first group, anyway. The first group of Son of Man, which is regarding future glory. 
The second group um, represent his present activity. Um, he takes a while to cover that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, that the, because he talks about how you know the Sabbath was made for man and not the man for the Lord. But in the end, it, the point of the whole, and we don't have time to go into that, but at the end, it, the point is that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is, the Son of Man is the Lord over the Sabbath. Uh, and he points out that this passage exactly illustrates something that Mark, Mark describes elsewhere. Because they were dismayed at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Because in, in, even in the parable of the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus places himself on the side of the lawgiver of God. He's not an interpreter, but the Lord. And this is where using Son of Man, not just this future glory, but in the moment, this is where you have to put yourself, he's in a crowd of people talking, and he, I mean, holy cow, whoa, pump, pump your brakes. He's using this phrase as if, he, not that he's interpreting the law like the scribes do, but that it's about him. That, that he is the law, that he is the word. And so the other parable that brings us to that is the account of the paralytic, uh, whose friends, they lower him down, you know, through the hole in the ceiling. And he's preaching, and they lower him down, and this guy is just, he's paralyzed. He just wants to walk. And so they're waiting for him to do that because he's been healing people. And Jesus takes this moment, and he doesn't speak words of healing first. Pope Benedict points out that he, instead of speaking a word of healing, as the paralytic and his friends were expecting, Jesus first says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And that, I mean, you got to, again, put yourself in this room, this stuffy, enclosed space. Jesus is teaching, and you're there. He's a teacher. And maybe you haven't noticed all of some of the things he's been saying. So he's just there teaching. And this guy gets lowered down, and people are like, oh, whoa, this is, this is an interruption. Let's see how he handles this. And because he's healed people, they're probably like, okay, well, he's just going to heal him and move on. And it'll be one of those great miracles. And instead of any words of healing, he looks at this paralyzed dude who didn't mention sins. He, he didn't mention that at all. He was just paralyzed. And Jesus looks at him and says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And people are like, in, because in the, in the narrative, you can hear it. Like they, they mumble, they grumble among them. They're like, what, 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 what do you, what do you, who, that's not, obviously wasn't the issue. What are you doing? Like, you're, you're losing your crowd here. You're losing your audience. But Jesus places himself, what Pope Benedict says, in the prerogative of God alone. There's only one who can forgive sins, and that's what the crowd brings up. Jesus, uh, what are you doing, man? You're not, you're not here to you heal people. You, maybe you're a magician. Maybe you're an amazing prophet or whatever. But you, <laughs> you, just, you just said you were God, man. Are you aware? And Jesus then, after de clarifying, or like beginning by saying, putting himself in the position of God, then he heals him. Basically, so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then I'll do this. So the first part is, he looks at all of them, so you will all know, he looks at you, so that you will know that the Son of Man has the ability to forgive sins, which is what really matters. Fine then, get up and walk. Because it, he asked them, which is easier to say? Forgive, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? And he just proves, I do them both. But the second aspect of this is that when he says those words, and you, you might have never thought of this before, but when he says those words in that account, when he claims to be divinity by his words, that is what leads to the passion. It's that moment in scripture that they decide, okay, that's enough. Uh, you're not just healing people, you're, you're blaspheming. You, you're, a, you're, you're, you're a blasphemous. You're, you're, you need to die. And it begins with that moment. When he doesn't leave really any doubt, as to what he's claiming. And again, we, we talked about, he comes on the scene, he's standing with the gray mass of sinners, he steps forward, heaven breaks open and starts to, you know, there's all these things happening, but then from his own mouth, he just lays it out. So that you will know that I can forgive sins and you could substitute, so that you will know that I am God. Get up and walk. So Pope Benedict points out, in that sense, what Jesus says about his authority points toward his suffering. Because Pope Benedict and Christ, obviously, 
They never let those two things be separate. His authority is because of what he does on the cross. His rule, his reign is on the cross. And so in this moment of speaking clearly his authority and where he comes from, it leads to his passion because they're together. They're, they're knit. And then the third group. So we move in. We had the, the son of man quotes about the future glory. The son of man quotes about the present and what he's done. And then the third group, just when he uses them, they predict the actual passion. And that's when they reach their inner center, their uh, culmination. Uh, and it gets topped when he says, For the Son of Man also came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because it's culminated. That's the inner meaning. The Son of Man, which is what we're talking about, this is Jesus identifying himself. Who are you? The Son of Man. And the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. That is why he came. So Jesus lived by the whole of the law and, and of the prophets, as he constantly told his disciples. But he, Jesus, regarded his whole being and activity as the unification and the interpretation of the whole, of the law and the prophets. Jesus himself, in his words and his actions, he's trying to clarify to us that he, even his self-regard, he regarded himself as the completion, the 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 actuality, the enfleshment, the incarnation of the Law and the Prophets. We've covered this over and over because this is every moment Christ is reiterating everything you've been waiting for, everything you've ever heard is me. Paul says Jesus Christ is the yes to all that God promised. So in 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1.20, for however many there are promises of God, their yes is in him. So their yes, the, the answer, the amen to all promises of God are in Jesus. So the Son of Man then, that using that phrase, presents us in, in concentrated form with all that is most original and distinctive about the figure of Jesus, his mission and his being. So the Son of Man is like the encapsulation of that, is, is all that he is, his mission, his being. Son of Man is like in concentrated form. Um, he comes from God and he is God. But that is precisely what makes him, having assumed human nature, the bringer of true humanity. So, like, human, so I always just, so after the fall, after sin, you know, the church says we have a darkened intellect and a weakened will. We're confused. We've forgotten who we were. And so, you know, humanity spends its existence all through the Old Testament up until the moment of Christ, spends itself trying to figure itself out. And God is sending the prophets and God is sending the law and he's doing everything he can. And then Christ comes. And because he comes from God and he is God, but then precisely because he assumed a human nature, he is the bringer of true humanity. You know yourself. I mean, that's what the church would teach, that Christ fully reveals man to himself. You look in a mirror, you see, you see almost like a fun house. You see in a mirror dimly. You don't see things clearly, even when you look at yourself in the mirror. And there, I mean, sometimes I'll see my wife, you know, look at, she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And my wife will look in the mirror and just, ugh, I can't, I can't fathom. But you don't see yourself clearly. But Christ is the clarity that we need. Christ is he is, he reveals us to ourself. He is all, he is what we're to be. So he talks about Daniel in the Old Testament. What Daniel glimpsed from afar as like a collective, like, because uh, he references, I saw something like a son of man. That in Christ, that now becomes person. But he points out even that, that this person existing as he, does, as he does for man transcends the bounds of the individual and embraces many and becomes with the many one body and one spirit. It, and we, we're not, we don't have time, but even just that passage, you read it in the book, even that passage regarding Daniel, I had to skip over so much. I think probably the most I've skipped is in this lesson. But just as a spark to you that not only just, you know, Daniel had this, bra this vague idea of the collective of the Son of Man. I saw something like a Son of Man. 
that Jesus is that in person, in singular, but then by being what he is, by being the representation and the fulfillment of all humanity and bringing humanity to us, then we become the fulfillment, we become what we're supposed to be, we become it in him and through him and with him, and it's this massive interconnectedness that I kind of, I, I was tempted to skip over because it's I know it's still vague. As I read it and say it, it's still vague, but I wanted you to at least get a glimpse or maybe a, a spark of curiosity to kind of delve more deeply into that. Um, but he, he moves on to say, this is the discipleship. Again, so our humanity is brought into it. How? This is the discipleship to which he calls us. That we should let ourselves be drawn into his new humanity. And from there, from his humanity, into communion with God. And we, we see this in the Eucharist. You see it in adoration. You see, you see it in the fleshiness of our faith. That through his new flesh, through his new humanity... We are drawn into, I mean, uh, the scriptures say that when you're baptized, that you are dead in Christ and you are raised a new creature. You are a new creation through his new humanity. The title Son of Man continued to be applied exclusively to Jesus. But the new vision of the oneness with God and man that it expresses is found throughout the entire New Testament and it shapes it. This, the new humanity that comes from God is what being a disciple of Jesus Christ is all about. Um, there's a band called Switchfoot, and one of their first albums, uh, they have a song, A New Way to Be Human. And you look it up, you might not like the style, or his voice, or the punk nature of the music at the time, but it's an it's just all about that. Like, nobody's famous, nobody's fine, nobody's, there's, we're, we all pretend we put a gloss on, but there is a new way to human, a new way to be human. Where, where, where divinity bends and our humanity bends and becomes what it couldn't be before. And that is what being a disciple of Christ is all about, is being something that this universe hadn't seen but was made for. So then he moves into, so that's the Son of Man section. Let me glance real quick, just to be safe. Okay, good. That's the Son of Man section. Uh, and then he moves into just the use of the word son. Um, so... A little back to, so son of man uh, was adopted uh, by Emperor Augustus, so Augustus Caesar. Um, and what they had taken on, they, the, the idea of being the son of God, sorry, son of God got taken, I said son of man, son of God got taken on by the emperor. And it was, it initially started as, um, it was very carefully thought out, and it was meant to, I guess, lead them into the understanding of that they believed that the emperor was from God. Um, it wasn't meant initially like Christ made it to be known, but it did, um, they tried to make it that to the point of that the worship of uh, the Roman emperor as a god was made binding throughout the empire. So you had to worship the emperor as God, as a son of God. And what happened was, uh, through the entire empire after Christ, but the fundamental, and this is Pope Benedict's quote, the fundamentally apolitical Christian faith, pause, that the Christian faith is fundamentally apolitical. It's so unpopular to say. It's unpopular to say among Republicans and Democrats, among conservatives and liberals and libertarians and uh, independents. It's just it, whatever brand of Christian people profess themselves to be, and uh, as much as they may like on the surface say that, well, no, you don't get involved in politics. Christianity these days, and not just these days, but currently, uh, so much of it has been hijacked by politics. When we exist as a, a like fundamentally apolitical belief system, we are apolitical. We, we, the, that is so secondary or tertiary. So what happened was in Jesus' day, or after in the, when the church was formed, that this fundamentally apolitical faith was now enveloped in a, in a day and age in which you had to worship the Roman emperor as God, or a son of God. And it's at that particular historical moment that Jesus comes along and makes the claim to be the Son of God. Not a Son of God. And, and he very clearly doesn't claim to be emperor or political ruler. And he comes along and makes this claim. And so what happens is this fundamentally apolitical belief system, which does not demand political power, but acknowledges the legitimate authorities, which Jesus did, render unto Caesar. Well, well who's, whose image is on the coin? Well, Caesar's. Well, give it back to him then. It's, it's all in his image, so give it back. But give to God what is God's, because you're in his image and likeness. 
so that uh, which acknowledges the legitimate authorities inevitably collides with the total claim made by the imperial political power. And in Benedict says, indeed, it will always, always, in italics, it will always come into conflict with totalitarian political regimes, and it will be driven into the situation of martyrdom. It will always, it's the entire history of the church, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the more political and domineering political systems become, then the more and more we are going to collide, because we're not here for that. We collide with it, and we have to grasp, and I, that's total, I know you're, some of you are checked out, or you're arguing with me in your head. I'm not saying that we can't function in the political realm. We are not political, though. It's not why we came. It's not why we were made. It's not why we were baptized into new life. And we will always be driven to the situation of martyrdom. And, but he, that's not the end. It's not period. Into martyrdom, period. Mm, it's going to suffer. It's this, that we will be driven to the situation of martyrdom, hyphen, into communion with the crucified, who reigns solely from the wood of the cross. So again, what are we here for? What will even martyrdom do? It will push us into communion with Jesus. And we find him through the cross, but we find communion with him. That is the point. And, and this society, we're easily the easiest Christian nation. I mean, it, it, we, we, our suffering is nothing compared to the people who died today because of their faith in Christ. But one way or another, Christianity gets pushed to that point of either white martyrdom or just like full-on martyrdom. But that martyrdom cannot, in any society that seeks to push us away from Christ, it can't win. Because through martyrdom, you get put into communion with God. Because he reigns solely from the cross. So then he begins, so, uh, hold on, I'm just worried, I'm gonna, there we go. Okay. He makes the statement that um, Jesus says that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And when it comes to understanding the term Son, Jesus as Son, not just Son of Man, but Son, that this is the key. The key to the whole passage is this sentence, that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and then anyone whom the Son reveals. Because only the Son truly knows the Father. Pope Benedict points out that knowing always involves some sort of equality. Um, we have, oh, hold on, so every process of coming to know something includes, in one form or another, a process of assimilation into yourself, a sort of inner unification with the knower and the known. And so when he's talking about equality and, and assimilation, think of it this way um, God creates Adam and Eve. Um, and it says that Adam knew his wife Eve, and they conceived a son. And in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the idea of knowledge, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that knowledge wasn't just do what you're told. And it wasn't that it was even a specific, you know, people, it was an apple, or it was this, uh, it doesn't matter what, if there was an actual tree, because the concept that you get in the narrative in Genesis is not so that you're like, what sort of fruit should I not eat? It's not that at all. The question is, or what, meant, what was meant by that, was more along the lines of, listen, you know good. You know me. You are intimate with me. You are in my image and likeness. We know on the intimacy level, like Adam knew Eve, we know each other. And you know good. Do not know evil. Do not be familiar with evil. Do not take it into yourself and assimilate it. And that's what happened. So this idea of Adam knowing Eve, this is, no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And then he, he adds, though, to anyone that he reveals. So this idea of, you know, to truly know God, that supposes communion with him, and presupposes communion with him. That Jesus, by saying this, says that he is in this intimate communion with him. And then the beauty is, pause, theology of the body. We know that the catechism says that God has revealed his innermost secret. That the Trinity is an eternal exchange of love and that we are destined to participate in that. That you are, like, you listening, you were made, like, actually made so that you would participate in the Trinity. That you would be taken up into and assimilated by and from and to know and be known by God. And this is, this is what is wrapped up in Son. And I skipped, you look in the book, you're like, you didn't even talk about Son. 
but time is a constraint. And if you had to sum it all up, it's that. When he uses the term son, this is what he ends up revealing. This level of intimacy and communion. This revelation that he, this man standing in front of them, was intimate with God, was in communion, was co-union with God, was receptivity and gift. And again, though, that that's how we come to know him is by that discipleship. That Again, you weren't called to just live a good life or to... At the end of it all, I've been saying lately, like, I don't want people to say at my funeral that I'm a good guy. I, it's just, I, I, A, not true. But B, like, that's not the point. That's not why we're living. I don't want to be thought of as a good person. I want people to say that's not, that shouldn't, his life should not have been possible. That's, that's not something I've never seen. I've never seen anything like that. Because that's what we're called. We're just called to be taken up into him. And that's where some of the, you know, not some, where the mystics kind of have that part right, where they, they would just be enveloped. They would be in this ecstasy with God that has to obviously go past emotion and, and, and just feeling it. But it has to go into the actual. It has to go into the being of, the, to, into the, be taken into the being of God. And so that leads us to the third one. Like Pope Benedict says there's this third revelation of Jesus' identity. And it is the I am, that term I am. Uh, it has two categories in scripture. There's, he says I am or, or I am he, those, those references. And then there's the I am, which then has more detail, like I am the vine, you know, I am the shepherd, like things like that, that it's the I am, but it has more detail to it. So he starts with just the I am. And you probably, I mean, the first moment you hear this is in Exodus 3.14 with the burning bush. Because Moses, he's out there. I mean, not, he wasn't out there seeking God. He was just out doing his job. And he sees this bush blazing on fire and not being consumed. And a voice starts speaking, take off your shoes, man. And God is speaking to him. And he says, well, what is your name? Because God says to him, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he's like, well, they're going to ask who's sending me. What is your name? And he responds with Yahweh. The Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, whose meaning the divine speaker himself interprets with equal enigma, I am who I am. And that's the key point. There's, there's many interpretations as to what was he getting at with the I am, but the, the key, the sort of common in all that is that God designates himself simply as the I am. He just is without any qualification. And that also means, of course, well, we'll pause. We won't go to that. First, that he just is. I love that because in, in that revenue, you've probably heard me speak on this before, but he says, like, I love that idea. Like, who am I going to tell them is sending me? I'm, I'm just a dude. I'm going up to Pharaoh and I'm making, let the people go. Well, who, who do I tell him is sending me? And God just says, tell them that I am. That's my name. I exist. And that's enough. He could say, you know, the God of vengeance and justice cometh in fire. He doesn't say that. He doesn't do any details, any qualifications. Just let them know that I exist. And that's enough. And you find that. That's, that's, the, that's what makes God God, is that he just is. The God above all gods, the king of all kings, the lord of all lords, because there's just nothing else at his level. He just is. So he just is without any qualification. And then again, Pope Benedict doesn't leave it grand and lofty. He just says, and that also means, of course, this is a direct quote, and that also means, of course, that he is always there for human beings yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That, that means he is, because he is, he always is. So he is always there for you. He is always there for you. So he says this, that during the time when Israel was deprived of land, and this is such a cool point that I had never even thought of, that during the time that Israel was deprived of land, uh, when they were in exile, um, and they didn't have a temple, God, according to traditional criteria then, could not compete with other gods. Because a god who had no land and could not be worshipped was not a god at all. 
These are the displaced people in this new land, supposedly having some God. Well, where is he? We don't have a place to worship him. You don't, what do you, you don't have a land. He obviously can't do much for you. He must not be a God at all. And with that, then God enters, he defines himself in those terms. I just am. So Pope Benedict points out that it's during this period that the people learned to fully understand what was different and new about Israel's God. That, <clears throat> in fact, he was not just Israel's God, lowercase g, the God of one people and one land, which would make him a competitor with the others, but quite simply, God, the capital G, God, God of the universe, to whom all lands, all heaven, all earth belong, the God who is the master of all, the God who has no need of worship based on sacrifices of goats and bulls, but is truly worshipped only through right conduct. This, this is, I mean, it seems so simple, I am. But this is, no, uh, hey, this is him revealing, like, I'm not just one of many. I am one. I am all. I am. So when Jesus says, I am he, he's taking up that story. He's referring it to himself. He's taking up this pivotal moment where God reveals his name, and then he's saying, and that's me. And so what Pope Benedict kind of takes a moment to just flesh out is that, what is at stake here? The issue is the inseparability of the Father and the Son. In, in, in recalling that in that dialogue of the Father and the Son, you see from the moment he's revealed, he, even publicly, you see that there's this unity, there is this oneness, this inseparableness. He says that Jesus is wholly relational. Like, Jesus, the man, exists as relational. Uh, in, in relationship. That's what gives the identity. His whole being is nothing other than relation to the Father. So go back to Son of Man, the idea of it just being man, that is what we're made for then. Oh, gosh. I can't, I can't take it sometimes. It's so crazy that we exist then. So Jesus himself, the Son of God, exists. His ident he exists in relationship to God. That is how he is known. He is the Son, which, you know, denotes the Father. So then he is son. He is son of man, and we are man. We are mankind. And so that, that is us as well. We gain our identity in our relationship to the Father and in nothing else. Not our job, not our parenting, not our marriage, not anything else you could put on a list. It's just you gain your identity and your awareness and your personhood from your relation to the Father because you are in his image, in his likeness. The I am is situated completely in the relatedness between the Father and the Son. Father, I am, like existence, Son. So when the Jews ask who he is, he begins with, I am he. But then he expands it to the reference to the future. Because when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. So it's this future thing that's going to happen, that is what, then you'll know. Then you'll know that I am he. I am not a rebel. I am not an anti, you know, establishment. I am not a revolutionary. When I am lifted up and I will draw all men to me, then you will know. Then you will know that I am he. I am he. Then you'll know that I'm God. Pope Benedict points out that on the cross, his sonship, his oneness with the Father, becomes visible on the cross. And, and in, its, the, in its completion on the cross. And he says, the burning bush is the cross. <laughs> what? Huh? What? You, <laughs> I don't know how his head does this. But he talks about this moment of revelation when God chooses the, for this first real moment to give his name to all of humanity. I am. That that moment is knit, is, is entangled with the cross. It is the cross. The highest claim of revelation, the I am he and the cross of Jesus are inseparably one. They are the same, especially for the eternal present, the, the God who is outside of time when all things are now. This moment, this, and picture this, this interconnectedness of time when in this moment we think it's, you know, millennia ago that, you know, this guy Moses is, is out there shepherding and he sees this thing where God is revealing himself 
and he creates this moment of exodus, but that moment, because Jesus being the fulfillment of Moses, that moment, not even in an abstract way, is connected by the God outside of time. It is the cross. It is God saying I am and showing that he is. This is all this, it's just so, it needs to be a movie. It needs to be better than Interstellar, which is cool, but because that gets into that interconnectedness of time. But just, I, it's all, it's all now. It's all, it's just, for God, it's everything. And we get to, we punch into these moments. We tap into these, we get these glimpses it, that start with the burning bush, but they end with Christ on the cross. What we find here, and we're winding down now. Let me just glance real quick. What we find here is not metaphysical speculation. He is not speaking metaphysically, but the self-revelation of God's reality in the midst of history for us. He says, then you will know that I am he. Pope Benedict says, well, when is this then actually realized? When Jesus says, then you will know that I am he, when? When will this be realized? Then he says it is re re realized repeatedly throughout history starting on the day of Pentecost, when the Jews are cut to the heart by Peter's preaching, and then as the Acts of the Apostles report, 3,000 people are baptized and join the communion of the Apostles. It is realized in the fullest sense at the end of history, when, as the seer of the book of Revelation says, every eye will see him, every one who pierced him. So again, it, it's realized in these moments. It's realized it is revealed on the cross. But again, that moment, I mean, people see it because you have the soldier who says, truly, this, this man was son of God. Think about that. A Roman soldier in, in the day in which you worship the son of God is the emperor. You have in the moment the revelation hitting so hard when he is lifted up that that's the declaration. No, truly, this man, this was the son of God. This was God. And it begins there, but it descends with the Holy Spirit and births the church so that they walk in and out into a square and they preach this truth. And it just, okay, I convert. I'm in. 3,000 men alone. Just, I'm in. In one day, I'm in. And it will be culminated in the end when, when all eyes see, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God, he is Messiah. And so you close with this, that in the Nicene Creed, which, again, you get to say this every Sunday. We say the Nicene Creed, we, and I said it already in this series, but in the Nicene Creed, we don't say what we believe. We say whom we believe in. Because you don't start, I believe in many rules. I believe in many things that I have to do. You don't, you just say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the one who made heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ his only son. And we profess that belief. In the Nicene Creed, the church joins Peter in confessing to Jesus ever anew, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You, you, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are everything. You are the anointed. You're what I'm looking for. And this is Jesus' revelation to us, him revealing his identity. So to close, going on from here, let's remember a few things. Let's recap. First of all, remember that he took his place with us on the banks of the Jordan in baptism. That he took his place with us from the first step. That he was tempted in all ways as you are. And he is the answer and he is the remedy to all of our struggles. If you are struggling now for any reason, financially, emotionally, depression, theologically, belief, if you are struggling and tempted he is the answer. He was tempted as you are. He was confronted with all of the struggles and temptations that we would face. And he did this for you. He revealed himself to us in the parables of the Good Samaritan and the Compassionate Father. He revealed himself to us that we can know that, again, in the Good Samaritan, that he, is, he has done all of this for us and that we follow him in through that. And in the compassionate Father, that the, only the Son, the Catechism 1439 says, that only the Son, only Jesus, who knew the abyss of God's love, could reveal to us in so simple terms 
We learn of his love for us. We learn of our call to be disciples, as we learn from Peter's confession. That was to, our call is to follow. When he makes that confession of faith, faith, they immediately begin the ascent to Jerusalem. And we, we also learn to be burned by the light of the passion and to be so transformed. In this Lent, we're approaching Good Friday. We're approaching the passion. Let it burn us. Let it burn our impurities. Let us burn away all that needs to be burned away and to transform us. And then lastly, let us remember that the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that this triune God is everything we read about in every page of Scripture, everything that was handed down to us in each word of the Catechism and the, the tradition of the Church, that God is the answer to every question. He is the object and the fulfillment of every desire of your heart. He is the one that your heart aches for. So in Lent and forever, let every yearning and question and temptation and beat of the heart and breath of your lungs draw you closer, closer and closer, deeper and deeper. Every heartbeat, every pulse, every tick of the clock, let it draw us into unity and eternity with him. Amen? Amen.